This is Michael Osterlink. Welcome to o Radio, where we explore individual and social transformation through collaborative action. I'm a psychotherapist with a transpersonal and somatic specialization. I'm also a transpartisan social entrepreneur and head instructor at SailFit's Unbeatable Mind Academy and executive coach at Spartan 7. Today's show is brought to you by Somatic Psychotherapy Today, an online resource for all topics related to body-oriented psychology. Today's guest is Dr. Amber Elizabeth Lynn Gray, who's an award-winning dance movement therapist, a somatic and human rights psychotherapist, a longtime practitioner and teacher of yoga, and an authorized continuum teacher. Amber has worked for many years with people who have survived human rights abuses, war, and torture. Amber originate, originated restorative movement psychotherapy, the only framework for dance, movement, mindfulness, and creative arts therapies with refugees and survivors of torture, and polyvagal informed dance. She is an innovator in the field of staff care for first responders in disasters and complex humanitarian emergencies. She is also a regular conference presenter and keynote speaker and has authored many peer reviewed publications on movement therapies and trauma. She regularly leads ecosomatic wild zines retreats for survivors of trauma. Hi, Amber. Hi, hello. Good to see you. <laughs> nice to see you too, virtually. <laughs> virtually. What an amazing biography that you have, and I'm sure it's just very short compared to your lifelong of amazing work you've done. Thank uh, you. Before we get into some of your more recent work, some of the nonprofits you do, and some of the work with trauma victims, refugees, et cetera, et cetera, uh, can you walk us through you know, what got you into movement therapies, somatic psychology, and that eventually led you down this path to create these, these new programs? Absolutely. I, um, I always reflect on this, this, this statement from my father. When I was getting my degree in somatic psychology and dance movement therapy, we, had to, we were taking a class on um, embodied development. That's not what it was called, but it was embodied development. And we had to interview our parents if they were alive on our birth. And I asked my dad about my birth. And the first line out of his mouth was, you were born dancing and fighting and you've never stopped doing either. That's awesome. Yeah. And um, I, I always loved to dance and I did it sometimes in classes and in, you know, ballet, which I didn't last very long in because it wasn't my type of body or dance, various forms of dance. I also loved free dance. I loved dancing out in nature, in the wild. I've always been a nature girl. And I also was from fairly young on a human rights activist or an activist. Um, I've always been an animal person, loved animals. My, my mom would probably say I always, uh, took care of the, the underdogs. I don't particularly like that expression, but she talks about that still. And so I, my pathway went from international relations and um, Spanish actually in college to public health, which took me in the direction of international work, but more at an organizational level, community level development, international development. And in that work, um, I missed I don't know that I would have identified it in this way then, but as things got more organizational and bureaucratic, I realized that I was more of a people person. Okay. And that I was more of a um, direct in the moment contact person. So I actually left and went to school to study massage therapy. And some of that was also related to deep discouragement with international development, which tends to be neo-colonialism and that's another discussion humanitarian work so i i did what i fondly referred to as my my hippie experience which i'd always wanted to do and i moved to santa fe and i studied massage and got into herbal medicine and things like that and working with people that directly i became really interested in the body and i i always say I, anatomy and geography are two things that i love and i started to realize that they were very related to me in my mind um, the way, the shape of things and the location of things and where things are hot and where things are cold, you know, whether it's a physical condition or a political situation. So I decided to take it another step clinically and was looking at everything from medical school to clinical psych to dance movement therapy to acupuncture and in an experience in Rwanda, which I, I think I've talked about a fair amount in, in other interviews, but I had an experience where I was working in the public health sector right after the genocide. 
and had a particularly scary trip to an area that had not yet been visited after the genocide and where most of the adults were killed and there was only children. And the children took the time to welcome those of us in our land cruiser with a little song and dance. They didn't know we were coming, but, and so I had this ex sort of very insightful, incredibly, you know, what I thought was one of those, um, what's the word, you know, one of those moments where you have a, a, a deep revelation, but it was also very naive because I thought, oh, well, I'm, I, I literally saw Naropa and I said, I'm going to go to Naropa. Dance therapy is the way. And did a dual somatic psychology dance therapy at very much with the intention of going into human rights and working with survivors of war and torture. I'd been a Peace Corps volunteer. I travel in places where there were political violence. I'd seen some things related to direct aftermath of war, you know, people who were killed, things like that, people being violated. And so I wanted to bring those together, all of them. Um, so that's kind of the path. And I went right into working at a uh, Survivors of Torture program right after U.S. Congress passed the, um, the um, Victims Relief, oh, the Torture Victims Relief Act, TVRA, which created a body of funding that still exists for survivors of torture. And began working in that field and really integrating it all together. So it was passion and path. What years would have this been around? I started at the, at the Rocky Mount Survivor Center in 1999 as an intern, <clears throat> or even as a pre-intern while I was getting my degree in somatic psychology. And then I stayed as a therapist and then became a lead therapist and then became the clinical director and then from there moved on to more consulting and the kinds of things I'm doing now. So, so before we get to what you're doing now with some of these various nonprofits and some of these new programs you developed, mm -hmm. let me ask you, when you first got into massage mm -hmm. and then later into the somatic psychotherapy movement program at Naropa, what did you learn about yourself in those two processes that interesting. informed your work? That's a really interesting question. Doing direct hands-on body work, well, I learned about the body. I, I, I learned, and, I, and I'm glad I had that experience going into a more, you know, psychological perspective on the body because I actually had very direct hands-on experience. I think what I learned about myself is, well, I definitely learned something that my family's been telling me forever is that I was a free spirit. <laughs> Because there was something about, I ended up then having a practice in the Rocky Mountains in Colorado, and I would snowboard for a few hours and throw my table, I had my table in my car. You know, I could live this very, what seems like, and I, it wasn't, I don't know if any lifestyle is ever idyllic, but, you know, mountain bike in the summer, yoga, do things to take care of my body. I realized how important taking care of the body was. And there was actually, um, one of the people I worked on was a chiropractor who ended up becoming my chiropractor. And I remember he would always say to me, you should never stop moving. You were born to move. And I really began to appreciate both through the flexibility that my life offered me, but through working as a body worker. And I integrated a lot of movement into body work, how important movement was and how, how you know, that we live in these bodies and whatever our perspective is, whether we're analytical or, you know, a really academic, theoretical person or a hippie skier who lives in their car, we live in these bodies. So I think that's what that experience gave me. And it, it, that's, I think that's why, you know, there was that illuminative moment in Rwanda, but there was also that, I think that's why the pathway led to somatic psychology and dance movement therapy versus a more traditional path. I remember my people who know me going, oh my gosh, you know, massage therapy. Now you're like, what is, you know, what is dance therapy and what is this crazy thing but it that then I mean that I would say that deepened my re revelation about how important the body and, and movement was because the more I as I studied dance movement therapy and somatic psychology and then have gone on and studied really wonderful things like trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy EMDR narrative therapy I just realized how core the body is to what I call the restorative process with trauma and how much I need my body to show up for the work. 
I need my body. I need to take care of my body. I need to understand my body. I need to move my body to show up for the work. What's that look like for you on a regular basis to live inside your body and move your body and, and be healthy inside your own body? It means paying attention. And, and I'm not saying that I'm perfect at this, but, but well, it's one of the questions that I, that I weave into my, there's a self-care component to the, to the um, training program that I run for body-based approaches to working with trauma. And it's what I call two key questions that we all um, must ponder if we're going to get into trauma work or really probably any work. And I would say even today's, today's world. And it's, um, what do I love and what do I fear? And I think that is, that's what it looks like is constantly, I, you know, I can answer those questions. I can make lists, but I think it's really important. I've taken more t time and I have more appreciation for how those questions live in me and what I have to do to organize myself when I'm in places that are more fear-based and how my body responds. I tend to get a little fluttery. I'm already an energetic. I've always been a kind of high energy person. So I can get, mm, you know, probably not helpful to somebody that I'm sitting with. Um, I, it's, it's, it's led me to deeply appreciate self-care, which is a term that sometimes gets eye rolls or even full body rolls <laughs> from people. <laughs> it used to from me. And self-regulation as the absolute essential ingredient in that idea of co-regulation if we're working therapeutically or in a group process, group structure. And how the only way I can do that is, is to pay attention to my body, to understand what certain sensations, certain postures. I, I've, not, I've got a, you know, a posture when I'm like tired that actually I can really ignore being tired, but there's a certain posture when I notice I'm doing it, I'm like, it's a slump. It's like, oh, I got to pay attention to that. So besides awareness of your respiratory system and bodily processes and structure, are there techniques that you use in the moment for, as you use the term self-regulation or arousal control, if you, in the case you brought up, find yourself a higher, higher energy level than it might be necessary or appropriate for a client you're working with? Absolutely. I um, call them structured practices. They're um, a big part of what I teach. They're actually probably the first in my, it's a four part series. It's what I emphasize because they're, I, they're powerful self-regulatory self -regulatory, self care practices. They're simultaneously stabilization practices for clients, both because when we do them, we're going to embody and express calm, connection. And when I teach them to my clients, and I'll teach them in, in ways that most of my clients, um, English is a second language, they've come from other countries. So I teach them in ways that um, I think are relevant, make sense for them. I have them practice them. They become part of our work together. So they are the go-to when we're in the wilderness of trauma processing and the intensity. You know, I know I know what my clients' clients' preferences are and, and I'll ask them, you know, and I'll I'll remind them if it gets tricky, we can do that grounding practice. Or we can ground in a way that they've discovered we like. We can come back to our breath. We can, you know, they're focused on working with the breath or ground, weight, spine. I actually just did a class this morning called Ground in the Swirl that I'm offering for people to help regulate themselves during this very challenging time. So they're part they're part of the therapeutic process, which I now call a reciprocal alliance based on the polyvagal informed movement therapies approach. Um, they're part of that. And I also think they are in and of themselves therapy. Mm -hmm. uh, not that everything has to be therapy, but they state shift so immediately. They provide an, an immediate resource to state shift physiologically. Can you give an example of a grounding exercise you might do with yourself and a client, as well as if it's integrated with a respiratory practice, breathing practice. Uh, you mean to actually like do it? Like yeah, just, yeah. I mean, you don't have to like spend your whole like, yeah, yeah. time, doing it, but just so we, so yeah. anyone listening and watching can get a, a sense of what you're referring to. Absolutely. Well, and I call this used to be called polyvagal informed grounding. I now call it grounding to earth, but you know, something that can be done standing or sitting 
the most common grounding practice, the, I think the most common ground, grounding practice is for people to press their feet into the ground. Um, and that works. This one is messed with the intelligence of the body through many years of working with the body, with survivors of trauma, integrating polyvagal theory, but also a lot of um, spiritual medicine. I've had a lot of opportunities to study with medicine people in different countries. And um, I try to stay away from the word shamanism because it's actually a much more specific has a much more specific meaning than many people understand, but that, that realm, <laughs> yeah. Um, <clears throat> so it involves an inhale where we contract um, particular muscle groups and they're in the lower body. The, I always say that the abductors, the hamstrings, hamstrings in the butt, sort of the back and side. And then the exhale, we let that constriction go and that provides oxy oxygenation. Um, and we just press the lower heels into the earth. And the reason for pressing just the heels gently, there's not a, there's not a big foot lift or anything like that. There's not a toe lift, um, is that that tends to keep the sacrum out of e a strong extension um, or a flexion. And it puts it in what's called sacral neutral. And sacral neutral promotes vagal tone, which is, you know, the measure that moves us in the direction of social engagement or what I like to call social and relational capacity. So we do it standing or, you know, if, if people have to sit, they can do it with their feet sitting, you know, I just make sure they're on the edge of the chair. So, and I have clients practice and then they may have their own way of doing it. And I adapt that. I never, I teach it the way that I teach it. It's usually very structured. We review it. And if they make adaptations, which many do, which might involve a metaphor or an image or sitting instead of standing or using their sits bones instead of their feet, that's what we do. I honor their experience of how, you know, how they've integrated that into their body. So I do want to get into some of your clients' experiences, your restorative mm -hmm. psychotherapy, as well as the polyvagal form dance. But you, you said something a little, little while ago that I'll paraphrase. And it seemed like you're talking scale, you know, the, the body has a lived experience for you. And then you didn't use the word body politic, but you talked about the, the larger framework in which we operate in within our institutions and, and such. <laughs> and I'm wondering, as you deepen your practice in the somatic movement field, um, how did that change how you saw the body politic and the various institutions that we've created as a reflections of how we, how we relate with one another in the world today? That is such a good question. I, um, it's interesting because I'm not, I'm not a historian, but I love history. And I'm going to adapt the language of my um, a beloved teacher, Emily Conrad, um, Continuum. She talked about the biohuman and biointelligence and acknowledged consistently, we acknowledge consistently in this body of work that species evolution uh, is, a, is, is the gift that got us here. And I call it evolutionary ancestry. We carry within us the memory of, you know, belly on the warm earth or um, belly, you know, in the cool water, whatever it is. And so it's interesting because when I think of the body politic or where we're going, I know that I'm constantly challenged by and questioning why we create so many institutions and bureaucracies that dehumanize and disconnect from the body. I, and I, I, I've especially worried in recent years about this, you know, this layer of technology. I mean, developmentally, we go from movement as a first language to more of that magical symbolic realm. And then we, develop the cognitive capacities to articulate and, you know, the, what I've seen is that the most recent research shows brain totally online around 25 years old. And now we've got this intense technological, um, really high speed reality that I don't think we've caught up with as a body. I think it's why it can be so assaultive and damaging and disorienting. Now everybody's going online because of the social distancing, which I prefer to call physical distancing so that <laughs> social distancing can be used to marginalize people. Um, that concerns me. And um, 
you know what, what I often talk about is the mind body split that occurred right around the 1400s. I think the area of Descartes, the era of Descartes that led to, I think before I, I think therefore I am, I always say he's on my list of international terrorists because he promoted cruel experimentation on animals. He separated, you know, the body became this dirty part of that whole movement where the church named the body as dirty and, you know, we're, pure and clean and there's such an appreciation for the more cognitive somewhere in that historical pathway i think the body politic became something that can separate us from our own bodies mm -hmm. i'm hoping that what's happening today with the covid 19 that as we are forced online that people start to remember and miss much more direct human contact um, because I, 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 and you know, just another question, I, I always think, why do institutions and organizations become bureaucracies? Why do they dehumanize? I know they don't all, but there's something about when a system, and I think it has to do with becoming more of a closed system, the human body is inherently an open system of strong containment, but we tend to separate ourselves. So I don't know that that was an answer, but those are my reflections around that question, ongoing reflections. One institution that's been in my mind is medicine, not not just because of the virus and stuff, yeah. but um, I, I follow the work of the Association for Pre Imperial Psych Psychology and Health. You know, they're great proponents of breastfeeding, as an example, but we've medicalized birth and we've medicalized that whole process. So now a lot of children, and I don't mean that medically necessity, just, but generally speaking, a lot of children are born, born C section as opposed to vaginally. So that changes the whole dynamic. And then a lot of children aren't breastfed. And those who are even breastfed for the length of time, that's even recommended if you look at indigenous folks. So just those as institutions yeah. which are separating us from physical contact at birth. <laughs> and yeah. you know, the innate intelligence of our bodies is problematic, I would imagine. Your yeah. 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 So back so back from the, the institutional systemic uh, concerns that you shared historically. Let's, let's walk back and talk a little bit about your restorative movement psychotherapy. Talk a little bit about that program you've created. So, well, and I'll say restorative movement psychotherapy, it's what I call it is the clinical counterpart or the clinical expression of the potomitant trauma and resiliency framework. So um, what that is, potomitant means the only way to translate it into English, I mean, it means center post but it comes from Vodou, the Haitian spiritual tradition, which is one of the places that I was schooled um, by an amazing medicine woman. And in, in that ceremonial practice, the center of the ceremonial or healing space is always marked by a potomiton. Women are, off, are also considered the potomiton of the family. Um, there's a community leader who's a potomiton. It's the center. It means energetically the center, the place of all, you know, of everything in a sense. So that framework is a component based framework. And what it really is, is the pieces that start that I realized were essential to working with complex interpersonal trauma, trauma caused by human rights abuses, mm -hmm. um, cross cultural, because my clients. I've worked both with clients who are refugees or asylum seekers coming to the US, or I've worked in international context, our four you know, active conflict zones, um, Lebanon you know, with the influx of Syrian refugees, Haiti, 2004 when it was you know, a low intensity conflict or after the earthquake. So those are the pieces that I realized were essential and there's a lot of components to it. Restorative movement psychotherapy is the name I gave the actual application or clinical practice. Um, and really, I would say polyvagal informed dance movement therapy and somatic therapies, it's really polyvagal informed soma movement dance therapies is, is what's evolved out of that. And at some point I might decide there's too many words and just call yeah. it something, but that's the developmental progression. And I didn't set out to create a framework to teach. It's just what one day I literally woke up at three in the morning and drew what I realized was helping. And it, it's a three dimension. It's a, I'd like to make three dimensional right now. It's a flat, you know, graphic. 
And then from that, I took the clinical processes, which is what I call restorative movement psychotherapy, because somebody said, well, you have to name it. <laughs> That's what I, restorative, very intentionally. I don't, I don't use the word recovery hmm. because I'm also a writer and we don't ever fully recover. Trauma is life changing. We restore what we can. You know, the house falls down, we rebuild it. It might be a different color wood or it might be a different roof or whatever it is. Um, and then in a, in I've, I've met Stephen Porges in like 99. Uh, we actually just had a chat last night. We realized we'd known each other over 20 years. And that started a very warm collegial friendship and a lot of idea, sh idea sharing, idea sharing um, collaboratively that resulted in polyvagalizing what I was doing. Um, so that's where that comes from. And this might be a good, let me just ask you this because polyvagal uh, uh, theory and, and utilization in, in uh, by therapists is becoming more and more popular. I see more and more right. books coming out, but it might be of value for people who are not familiar with one's biology <laughs> yeah. theory. If you could just give like, you know, two minutes on it. On the polyvagal theory? Yeah. Two minutes. <laughs> well, well, here, here a little. Bit. So, there, I think the historical framework is is the one to take. So, Stephen Porch is in his dissertation research um, was looking at the work of, and now I'm I'm dropping the name, the Voodoo Death. Oh, the name um, of the researcher who documented that. I think back in the '40s. I think it was William Cannon, and started to suspect the existence of a. Um, parasympathetic i'm going to say a parasympathetic involvement in he was really working with autism a lot and i don't know the exact timeline um that work shifted into working with trauma but a lot of times stress stress reactions fear and trauma have always been categorized as being primarily sympathetically adrenal driven from the perspective of um, the autonomic nervous system the common is the common metaphor is the break in the accelerator. When there's so much sympathetic adrenal input, we're in those states of hyperarousal, or what we would call mobilization and fear from a polyvagal perspective, the break comes on the parasympathetic to maintain homeostasis. Um, he started to suspect a completely parasympathetic reaction, which is what he calls a mobilization in fear and discovered that the vagus nerve, the 10th cranial nerve, um, which originates in the medulla oblongata, the brain, um, where the brain stem meets the spinal cord, um, had two distinct pathways. So the dorsal vagal and the ventral vagal circuit. And the dorsal vagal circuit, it's the old vagus, it's the one that um, innervates down in the gut area, the viscera reptiles have you know some aspect of that but the ventral vagal which connects which um they both emerge from slightly different places in in the medulla oblongata at different areas and they have diff different pathways so the ventral vagal is the one that goes up to the face and into the heart and so that's why you know one of the things that i think the polyvagal theory has really illuminated is that our face really does reflect our heart our emotions really shine through our face all of that. Um, but he's, his research has really illuminated the evolution of the vagus nerve in the mammalian circuit, which gives us a lot more capacity for facial expression and, you know, more complex verbalization and really being able to demonstrate our, our safety, how safe we are as a person, how relational, how interesting we are um, through the more complex dance of those neural circuits. How was that for two minutes? That's awesome. <laughs> okay. That's like a four day course in two minutes. Uh, but it might be, I think it also be value for the, for the viewing and listening audience too, to understand, okay, so th there's this nerve plex it, it connected to the parasympathetic nervous system. How do you as a therapist working with clients who are dealing with trauma helped activate it? Yes. So people have the benefit of it being turned on if, if, you, if that's a correct term to use. Absolutely. So I, this is where, this is why there's this refinement in restorative movement psychotherapy of polyvagal informed dance movement somatic therapies. And what I realized one day, and I actually remember it was in um, Norway and I was teaching with Stephen Porges and his wife, Sue Carter. 
and we were having a conversation and um we've been taught i've been i've been in haiti very recently and he just expressed curiosity he says you know we've done this a few times and i you know i've seen this dance movement therapy and really interested in the psychotherapeutic i'm really interested in, in what do you do in voodoo you know because he knows of my relationship to haiti and bring more of that in and so i started thinking more about that and i realized that what what the ancients do in terms of restorative healing and ceremonial practices is state shift mm -hmm. state shift through ceremony through drumming through dance through chanting through um vision questing through all those different things and so that became really core to what i teach it, do, it really doesn't matter whether it's restorative movement or polyvagal form. They're really sort of through this natural evolution, probably going to be, I mean, they're really just, they're really a pathway that reflects the same work. So I work with all those structured practices. I describe very intentionally in state shifting, physiological state shifting, some more intentionally ground and center some more intentionally calm and relax, some more intentionally energize and mobilize. Some will simply work directly with the breath, the nervous system, and what I say is they will regulate the body in the direction the body needs to be regulated because a person may not know, and I'm not any authority with my clients to say, oh, you need to calm down, you need to energize. For a long time, self-care focused on how to relax, um, last time I took a course in trauma focused CBT, the focus on the somatic aspect was relaxation. We don't always need to relax. Sometimes we need to stay in a fairly alert, mobilized, energized state if we're working in an active war zone, if we're living in a situation of domestic violence. Um, how do we state shift from that being fear based to more non fear based, which is what we talk about is play state. So how do we engage with that energy? Um, if somebody's really shut down or dissociative, how, and it's, it's terror-based, it's really hard to shift to a deep rest. And mm -hmm. sometimes we have to upregulate them to something that's more energized. And there might be an edge of fear to it. Mm -hmm. the and then we might have to engage in that more mobilized energy and shh, sort of move the fear and then come back down. So state shifting, and it's through structured practices, but also there are a lot of principles that I've categorized in my own mind body as being essential to deep trauma processing through the body. And when I teach that, when I work with those or when I teach them, they're very, very intentionally along with the tracking, the, the ability to track those state shifts and to navigate that terrain of trauma processing, to shift it, whether it means, do we take a pause? Do we get up and walk? Do we get a glass of water? Do we go deeper? Do we back off? Do we come back to that next week to really track those state shifts and to really, and more importantly, to empower our clients to notice them and to have the skill to start to master them so that they Self-modulate, self-regulate, stay in the window of tolerance. People use different terms. Um, so that's how I work with it. I would, did that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, thank you. So, and and movement, I mean, I'll just say that movement directly accesses the neurological underpinnings of everything, our thoughts, our feelings, our behaviors. So they're all movement-based or body-based. And movement can be stillness, can be tracking the breath or a sensation, so. Right on. Um, a couple of questions. So you, you talked about teaching. You have a program where you teach other uh, only therapists or can other healthcare practitioners uh, participate? Like how does that work for your students? Who are your students? I, well, they vary. I've, I've worked with, I was recently talking about, I, I did a taught it was quite some years ago now, maybe, wow, 10 years ago in Turkey, Istanbul, Turkey. And it was male psychologists and psychiatrists from all over the Middle East. <laughs> I, I teach dance movement therapists. Um, my body is voice is what I call my um, course that integrates all of this. It's alternate route approved for dance movement therapy, which means it counts at a graduate school level for dance therapists. Um, 
but everybody, I welcome a mix. Oh, good, good, good. Biodiversity, right? Biodiversity, but we know that diversity is important. And that, that's, that's, a, that's a climate crisis statement. That's a political statement. Um, a social, it's a social justice statement. So I welcome a mix. I have done courses that are, you know, much more clinically focused, but when I have a mix, I integrate. I've often had physiotherapists, massage okay. therapists, body workers, yoga teachers. I believe the skills, um, and I refine the course according to who I'm teaching. Recently, I had a cohort that was literally half people from the torture treatment refugee mental health world who wanted to engage more with the body and had been following my work, half dance movement therapists. It was a beautiful orchestra. It was, it was all these different and people really learn from each other. So I think it's more potent. And I think we learn when we listen to other perspectives, even if we know I'm not gonna to touch a client, I'm a psychologist, I'm a body worker, I'm not gonna go into that deep level of processing, but we can all relate those processes to the way that we're meeting other human beings and offering them you know, respite, restoration, healing, whatever it is. For you presently, what, what is your cutting edge explorations? my cutting edge explorations. The interface between science and spirit. Okay. Um, I recently was talking to somebody and I said, I'm either polyvagalizing voodoo or voodooizing polyvagal. Voodoo, of course, the English word is voodoo, but everybody goes, oh my gosh, run. Voodoo, but it's a deep spiritual practice. Um, I'm studying now with, I have a wonderful Aboriginal teacher, so I'm very interested in that intersection and I'm exploring that deeply. That's awesome. And in that is also the intersection between uh, it's 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 climate it's related to back in 2008 i tried to propose a chapter for a book it was called endangering humanity and i was going to write about the relationship between human rights abuses and the abuse of the earth and how fast we were speeding up climate change and i was told that it was not relevant i was actually the chapter was rejected because they were like yeah you know, oh, that's a little bit extreme. Look where we are now. So I'm, I'm that, even if I don't talk about with my clients climate crisis, my work, I'm also really exploring that edge of how we are part of the earth, how the earth is part of us. You know, engaged so, ecosoma therapy is what I would call it. It's engaged, yeah, yeah not that, <clears throat> you know, things get, there's so many labels out there, but and the human animal interaction. I am an animal lover. And so I run a retreat. I just had to cancel my retreat with dolphins because we were supposed to leave in two weeks. Oh. Borders are closing. Um, in August, I will be running my retreat with whales. We, we do movement practices and swim with humpback whales. Wow. I'm running a retreat this year specifically for veterans um, that I've actually, that's a funded retreat for veterans, um, combat trauma so working with that edge i'm wanting to i've done before pet therapy was a thing back in the early 2000s i was working with dogs and clients and and actually very um yeah a lot of my clients that just interacting with anything living because of the depth of the of the abuse in a human rights context uh, often i use inanimate objects or animals as a way to start to reconnect um, initially before getting into the human realm. So very interested in that. And, and that's what wild, it's actually wild zenness. Wild, it's connecting I zen to the, you know, it's like how, how the wilderness speaks to our nervous system, our heart, our soul, our body. Those are my edges. I love that. That's great. <laughs> no, it's fantastic. So uh, can you say just a little bit more about Actually, let's do this. Name your animal program and how people can learn more about it. That'd be a good start. Well, Dancing the Wild Home is the annual retreat with okay. whales. Okay. Dreaming the Dolphin Sea is the retreat with dolphins, which will happen again next year. Okay. You know, we've been exploring wh whether to try to do it again. I don't know about this year. I just don't know about the next few months. Um, I teach something called, from a continuum perspective, I'm also a continuum teacher, which is, which is very much a part of, I have a very polyvagal focused continuum course called Radical Freedom, but um, yoga continuum, I mean, I have 
sometimes I teach just those, sometimes I integrate them all together, but I teach a continuum retreat called Stirring the Stars, where we really work with um, our animal body and our more cosmic body. That's actually a continuum term that Emily Conrad, I think, I think she coined it or it came out of working, it came out of the work, the continuum work. Um, so there's a lot of different ways that I do that, but I also have a nonprofit called Trauma Resources International, and the website has not been updated yet, but I currently have, it's project specific, so I don't run a nonprofit, but one of the projects right now is called Cosmos Heart. It's an animal rights project. Um, about eight years ago, I realized that human rights are animal rights and animal rights are human rights and that we really have to tend to each other. And one of the loves of my life was a long haired dachshund named Cosmo who had a pretty tough journey. It was a rescue dog, lost both eyes that we had to have them removed. Um, he actually taught me a lot about, he, 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 he helped enhance the polyvagal and the spiritual approach because I had to watch what, you know, they severed his eyes. So that connection to the, to the vagal, ventral vagal, um, he died. And shortly after that, I um, started rescuing dogs. I just got involved. And so that's, I actually support res rescue dogs with a specific shelter in Southern California, the Moreno Valley. And I send them up to the Pacific Northwest. Oh. I, the, I also have a project in Haiti with a group called Dance to Save Lives, where we're working with Haitian traditional dance and um, have been working on a project in Australia on integrating traditional dance and dance movement therapy. So I focus on specific projects, but the say the animal rights one is the busiest right now. You're very busy. <laughs> I'm I'm busy and I'm sometimes I'm too busy and I also I'm also engaged I think I'm engaged too. I just you know I I even though I'm utterly frustrated with the world and and sometimes fr frankly frustrated with human beings in terms of how long it's taken to wake up to to the planet changing the changes and the things that are happening uh, i'm also i love this world and i you know we've been given such a beautiful playground with the plant nation and the animal nation and the ocean nation and we're part of that and i really i i, I tend to follow my crazy questions that come up and i'll just be like oh, okay i think i mean one of them was whales are more compassionate because i think they have more myelination um in their vagus nerve and i have all these ideas about why so i started swimming with them and i was like oh i think i'm right can't measure it but yeah so i, I follow crazy questions have you spoken at one of the bioneers conferences yet no, I've been to them a long time ago, but I have not spoken at one. They just put out a whole program called, I think it's Natural Intelligence, maybe. I, I don't want to mispronounce, misquote the name, but they actually talked about uh, some whale work that they're, that a scientist is doing and dolphin work that a scientist, they're just interesting. They're, they're, um, promoting people doing really interesting work with different, in different fields. Huh. Like walking to plants as one thing, yeah. whales and dolphins. I think you should speak at one of their conferences. I'd Canada. love to. I actually met one of them. I think one of them lives in Santa Fe. Yeah, well, if you have any, yeah. Cool. Anybody I should approach, I'd love to, yeah. That'd be awesome. Well, I'll make sure to include all the things you're involved in in the show notes. People can check out the various nonprofits and charities and, and other types of work that you do do. Um, do you have a website that people can just, if they just want to visit the totality of who you are and what you do? I do. It's uh, www.ambergray.com, G-R-A-Y. It's apparently hard to find because there's an actress named Amber Gray. Oh. Um, so, she, but, and I'm trying to figure out how to be more, more Googleable. but if people put in www.ambergray.com, they'll get to it. They and are do you on any other social media? Facebook, I have Amber Elizabeth Gray is my, just my, my longtime Facebook page where I'll post my work, but I also every now and then do a rant or two and <laughs> post a dog that needs adoption. Amber Gray Movement Therapies is where I consistently list my, my workshops all over the world, my, oh. my work, my training. Um, then I have a page for Cosmos Heart. I have a page for Dancing on the Wild Home and for Dreaming the Dolphin Sea. 
and Trauma Resources International, as I said, it's a very outdated website. That's my next project, which I may have more time to work on than I thought I would this year. <laughs> Stuck at home, right? Yeah. Yep. Well, stay safe. Uh, it's been you too. fantastic to have this conversation with you. I hope our paths cross sometime in the near future. I and, do too. Uh, thanks for joining. Thank you so much, Michael. Lovely to be with you for an hour virtually. Same, same. Take care. You too. Okay.